welcome to this service. I'm Michael Gilliam. I'm one of the readers at St. James's Church. Welcome to all of you, whether you're here in person or whether you're listening now or later online. <coughs> Special warm welcome to those who may be joining us, especially because this is a Remembrance Day service. I, I guess for most of us here around my age, our first thought is of the Second World War. I'm wearing my father's medals, as I'm allowed on the right-hand side. He flew in the Lancaster. I'm indeed fortunate that he survived long enough for me to appear. I could also have worn my grandfather's British Empire medal, awarding, awarded for helping to keep Barry Docks operating during that war. My school had a patch of melted concrete when an incendiary bomb landed harmlessly, but the town had bomb sites. When I arrived at St. James, there was Charlie Herkham, sitting in the corner over there, one of the old contemptibles, that group of regular soldiers that Britain sent at the outbreak of the First World War. Too few and too late to save Belgium. Sorry, Fabian. That war, to end all wars, if only, led to the poppies we are wearing. Another early memory was visiting Gloucester Cathedral and seeing a cross carved by a POW of the glorious Gloucesters during the Korean War, because wars did not end in 1945. We have in the congregation today a, a veteran of the Kuwait War, and I remember the anguish of Tim Jones when a member of 40 Commando, who he had married, was killed in Afghanistan. What his new wife suffered can only be faintly imagined. We now have members supporting refugees from the war in Ukraine. The truth is that wars have continued year on year, and we have all been touched by them. My father had nightmares about flak when he was old. We, too, are all still touched by the war. We're here to remember with thanks those who lost their lives or risked them to enable us to be free. We're here to give thanks for God's deliverance. And we must also be here to pray for peace and back our prayers by action wherever and whenever we are able. Please would you stand for the gathering. We have come together today to remember, to remember with thanks those who have given their lives in service of others, to remember with sadness the suffering, destruction and pain caused by human conflict, to commit ourselves to be peacemakers and peacekeepers wherever we can. In Jesus' name, Amen. And we're now going to sing, We Seek Your Kingdom.
Please sit. Now, Fabian has an exciting announcement. It's exciting, but it's a little bit sad too. Um, Dave, can you come? Um, and yes, part of the family is there. Good to see you, Edith and Donna, uh, Dora and Joy. <laughs> so I have to make the following announcement. Uh, with the Reverend, Right Reverend Jackie Searle, Acting Bishop of Exeter, and Reverend Carol Green, Team Rector on, and Parish Representative. Um, with them, I'm delighted to announce that subject to the completion of all the statutory formalities, uh, an offer has been made for the post of team vicar of the benefice, and now there are a lot of here parishes, so I, I, I'll make a mess of it, but we'll try. So the benefice of Tinmouth, Itford with Luton, Ashcombe, and Bishop, Bishop Stainton. That's not too bad, huh? That's good. Well done. Known as the Alden Mission Community, to, so that has been um, given to Reverend Dave Wilkie, who has accepted the offer. So, congratulations. So, his licensing will, uh, by acting bishop, the acting bishop of Exeter, will take place in spring 2024 uh, on a day that still needs to be confirmed. So, watch the space. But uh, you will be uh, working across uh, a team, uh, providing ministry in various churches, um, but your ministry will also be de um, devoted half-time, especially to children and young people, so that's, that's great. Uh, so we're really delighted for you, for all of you children, and for Donna, and um, we will be praying for you in this time of transition, but well done and congratulations. Thank you. Thank you everyone. And for a shorter time, we say goodbye to the children. Let's pray for them. Our Father, we pray that all of us together may worship you. We pray that our younger members, as they go to their special session, would really enjoy hearing more about you and would be growing into your likeness, as we should be. Amen. Now I'll hand over to the music group. Good morning. So this morning's praise time is going to be slightly different. Um, so we're going to sing one song, then we're going to have a confession, and then we've got another two songs to sing, so I'll be coming back up when we've done the confession. Um, this first song is Be Still for the Presence of the Lord. The Holy One is here. So let us just be still for a moment and prepare our hearts to see what the Lord wants to say to us. Lord, I pray that you will come amongst us now as we praise your name. Amen. Let us stand.
We're coming in this quietness to a time of confession. We confess to each other and to you, our Creator, that we fall short of being what we have been created to be, what we have committed ourselves to be, disciples of the Kingdom. Hear us, forgive us, renew our resolve to build the Kingdom of Peace. We often seek out the easiest paths, paths of least involvement in places where we might be uncomfortable, or paths of self-centeredness. Hear us, forgive us, renew our resolve to build the kingdom of peace. Forgive us for getting so caught up in the world's trappings and its false messages of hope that we lose sight of the hope of the kingdom which brings healing and peace to a world in turmoil. Hear us, forgive us, renew our resolve to build the kingdom of peace. In this time of worship, may we resolve to become more kingdom-minded, to be your peacemakers, here and now. Amen. And I'm handing back to the music team. So our next two songs, the first song, we are going to be singing of what Jesus did, that there is so much love, vast as the ocean, loving kindness as a flood, when prince of life, our ransom shed for us his precious blood. And our last song, uh, make a channel of your peace. Um, where there is hatred, let me bring your love. So in this day of remembrance, let us bring a channel of peace and love to the people around us this week. Let us stand.
face it and Richard and Martin are going to bring our readings to us. Our first reading this morning comes from the book of the prophet Micah, at the beginning of chapter 4. In the last days, the mountain of the Lord's temple will be established as the highest of the mountains. It will be exalted above the hills, and peoples will stream to it. Many nations will come and say, Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the temple of the God of Jacob. He will teach us his ways, so that we may walk in his paths. The law will go out from Zion, the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He will judge between many peoples and will settle disputes for strong nations far and wide. They will beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation will not take up sword against nation, nor will they train for war any more. Everyone will sit under their own vine and under their own fig tree, and no one will make them afraid, for the Lord Almighty has spoken. All the nations may walk in the name of their gods, but we will walk in the name of the Lord our God for ever and ever. In that day, declares the Lord, I will gather the lame, I will assemble the exiles, and those I have brought to grief. I will make the lame my remnant, those driven away, a strong nation. The Lord will rule over them in Mount Zion from that day and forever. As for you, watchtower of the flock, stronghold of daughter Zion, the former dominion will be restored to you. Kingship will come to daughter Jerusalem. This is the word of the Lord. Our New Testament reading continues with the, about the prophecy of the first, from the first reading. At the end of the revelation to St. John, the final vision of a new heaven and a new earth focuses in on Eden restored. Revelation 22. Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life, as clear as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb down the middle of the great street of the city. On each side of the river stood the tree of life, bearing twelve crops of fruit, yielding its fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree are for the healing of the nations. No longer will there be any curse. The throne of God and of the Lamb will be in the city, and his servants will serve him. They will see his face, and his name will be on their foreheads. There will be no more night. They will not need the light of a lamp or the light of the sun, for the Lord God will give them light, and they will reign for ever and ever. The angel said to me, These words are trustworthy and true. The Lord, the God who inspires the prophets, sent his angel to show his servants the things that must soon take place. Look, I am coming soon. Blessed is the one who keeps the words of the prophecy written in this scroll. This is the word of the Lord. 
Thanks be to God. In a moment, we're going to have our act of remembrance, and part of that will be the usual poem that we quote. I looked this up, and I was surprised to hear that it was written not as I had imagined after the end of the First World War, but actually mid-September 1914 when it was just that small army that had been sent. And there had been the Battle of Mons, and a battle was starting on the Marne, but so few had died. But this poet, who was too old himself to join up, although later he served with the Ambulance Corps, could see the horror that was going to happen, a horror that we are only too well aware of now. So he sat on the North Cornish coast, far removed from the battle, without having seen it or heard any news of it, but yet he could see what was going to happen. Since that time, there have been many deaths. The last year when there were no deaths in the armed services was 2016. Before that, 1968. Deaths are a regular part of that service. And of course we must remember that there are wars that we as a country are not involved in. Wars now that we remember. So these words that we will be saying in a moment are very poignant. Something of a far-sighted person but one filled with sorrow for what was about to happen. I was asked too by one of my home group to mention that we owe a debt of gratitude to many people from what was then the Empire, but now mostly the Commonwealth. People from many nations came to our aid when we had need both in this country and Europe, but also in the Far East. And we must remember them with gratitude too. They had no reason to support us, and indeed many of them, as we know, had reason to not feel kindly towards this country. But we must nonetheless be grateful to them. Could I ask you to stand, please? They shall not grow not old, as we that are left grow old. Age shall not weary them, nor the years condemn. At the going down of the sun, and in the morning, we will remember them.
Please be seated. As Christian, we all know the uh, passage that says, where two or three are gathered together, uh, God promised to be uh, among them. But I think there is another saying that's um, quite true too, that where there is a group of two or three people, human conflicts arise. It's true. Even the people that are closest to us, our spouse, a brother, a sister, a child, there will be conflict. The sad is when those conflicts can't be resolved or when they grow into communities, cities, nations, or between nations. And so today we remember those who have died in conflicts across the centuries and around the world. And we pray for those loved ones who are, to this day, in places where they have to fight. And we grieve for the reality of wars and conflicts in our world. Going to have some. some of you will straight away recognize this place. If you've been visiting, this is called the Menning Gate in Belgium, in Ypres. Um, and it's a war memorial for uh, those who died um, in that area, uh, British and Commonwealth soldiers who've lost their lives. Uh, in, in the Ibis assailant of World War I. And it's dedicated to all those soldiers that um, we couldn't um, bury, so they have no graves. And on that monument there are 54,000 names of soldiers. And every evening at 8 p.m., something of what we've experienced now happens there. Uh, the last post ceremony is held at the gate, and it has happened since 20, uh, 1928, without any interruption, only during uh, the years the Germans' occupation in World War II. So why do I want to show you this? Well, because if you've ever been there, I think you will understand something that I try to exp- express during the World War I, when the conflict was at its height, this was a place of utter despair. Utter despair. The battles that took place there were horrific, to the point that even the Germans used um, poisonous gas. And yet, when you go there now, it's a place that has been transformed into, and you can't really describe it, a quiet contemplative experience. When you go uh, at 8 o'clock, they stop the traffic and they uh, do the last post and it's nearly, nearly close to a religious experience, even if you're not a believer. There is something in that place that is, we could say, out of this world. And it brings people from all over the world and the fact that it has happened every day since 1928 is just something above understanding. And I think in both our readings is this that I want to express. Despite what we see today, despite maybe what we experience in our own conflicts, at home, in our communities, with ourselves, God has promised, has promised a future that will truly bring peace and hope. And we have those two readings, the Old Testament readings from the prophet Micah, and we have the last book of the Bible and one of the last chapter of Scripture. So let's start with Micah. Let's start with a little bit of background. Um, Yes, Micah was this prophet, one of the 12 minor prophets of the Old Testament. And throughout his book, um, it's, 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 it's a message to the whole world. And it says something of God's plan to use Israel to bring blessing to the whole world. That has always been his plan since when he started with Abraham. I will use your descendants to be a blessing to the whole world. And Micah has lots of similarities with another great prophet, a big prophet, Isaiah. 
and his ministry uh, preceded him by about 40 years. But the message was very similar. And first, it was a message of judgment. It was a hard message to say to Israel. And when I say Israel's, there were two parts, the north part and the, and the part around Jerusalem and Judah. And the first message was that the north part would go into exile, but also um, Jerusalem and Judah, the southern kingdom, will also end up in exile. And when we, you read through um, their, their prophecy, um, they didn't rejoice saying those words. They didn't enjoy speaking words of judgment. They didn't have a spirit of vengeance saying, ah, you, you, you now have what you deserve. Now, on the contrary, Micah, Isaiah, or maybe the best known is Jeremiah, they were agonizing when they saw the destruction that was to come. They were identifying completely with their people. Both they were also seeing that the judgment of God um, was to work out a plan of salvation, was to work out a change of heart and a change of mind. Because God wanted to use Israel to be a blessing, and they had forgotten that, and they had taken a path that instead of being a blessing, they were a message of death to the world. Israel was meant to be a light to the nation. And it was given a land. It was not their land. It was a gift, an inheritance, to be a place where they could express the kind of life God wants for all his people. And so they had been given a, a constitution and laws to live that way so that other people could be amazed and say, your ways is the way. The God you are following is the true God. Micah is well known for that, well, uh, uh, for that passage in chapter 6, verse 8. He has shown you, O mortal, what is good and what does the Lord require of you to act justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with your God. And that's what they had failed to do. And you have there uh, verses. God does, doesn't just want us to be to hear his word, but to hear it. And a lot of the prophecies about hearing and seeing and about coming to your sense and returning and, and the, the, the message of, of, of judgment are first of all a message to hopefully bring them back before it happens. Hear and heed to the word of the Lord. And those prophecies uh, took centuries to, to say decades and decades to say, please come back to God. But they didn't. So in, Micah denounced the oppression of the poor and the vulnerable by the powerful and the wealthy. He brings to light the dishonesty, the fraud and the deceit, emphasizing the need of people to deal with just, justly and, and to be kind to another. He shows God's concerns towards the least, and in those days were the widows, the orphan and the foreigner. And he demonstrates the direct link between worshipping false gods, turning away from the true God, and moral decay. Sometimes when I read that, it says it sounds so true of what I actually experience as a human being in our world today. You see, the problem is not that they were not religious. If you went to Jerusalem at the day, you would see a very religious people. You would see a temple, they would do things, they would... But the devotion was just superficial. They were just following the motions. They were talking the talk, but they were not walking the walk. Their hearts were not devoted to God. Today, someone has coined that, um, a great theologian, like cheap grace. And we're all in danger, even as Christians, to fall into that where religion or our faith is just a source of security and comfort. But it's not about obedience, allegiance, about being followers of Jesus, but wanting his life to be expressed in and through us, about sometimes making hard decisions away from sin so that we can live truly with God and for God. Take heed what you hear. And there's the promise. The more we 
take heed, the more when we hear God's message to us, and by his grace and his strength through the Holy Spirit, we allow him to transform, the more God will be able to give us his message and to make his plans grow in our lives. And that's the journey of faith. But we need to take heed. We need to hear the words and to heed them. Whoops, I've done something wrong. There we go, there we go. It's coming. That's it. So in going back to uh, uh, Micah, what he wanted is them to come back, but he also knows that despite the judgment that will come and the exile will come, and they have come, both were exiled, one to the Assyrians and one to the Babylonians, there will be a coming back, and this is the passage. There will be a day when those sent in exile will come back and their hearts and their minds will be healed and restored. The vision of a peaceful kingdom. We hear, go up, and that's the expression of a pilgrimage. People will go to Jerusalem again. The mountain of the Lord is where God resides, the place where people will want to hear the Lord's words. They just not want to hear. This time they want to heed. They know it's the best way to live. The nation will realize God's way alone can bring them satisfaction. And it's a voluntary um, pilgrimage. They will want to go. They go there not only to worship, not only to do the motions, but they want to learn and they want to obey and they want to change. They want to be transformed by it. No, what the prophet often sees is only part of the whole plan of God. And they only saw the coming back, the Jews being there, but it was still on your stage. They had to come back so that the Messiah, the one to come, was able to be part of that nation and bring about the definite change, the coming of God's kingdom, the coming of God's ruling. And as Christian, we know it is Jesus. Jesus God with us. Jesus God who replaces the temple as the presence of God. He is the very presence of God among us. He is Emmanuel, God with us. And we're going to enter in that season of Advent when we're going to look back at those stories of God dwelling and coming to live with us. He is also now the one who is lifted on high. If there was a mountain and it was a place and a temple, now it's Jesus who has who is uh, at the highest, who will draw all nations to himself, people from all languages, all places, all culture, all colors. He is the one who has authority now over all people. When he left the disciples just before the ascension, he says, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Now go, go make disciples, go share that good news with others. He is the Prince of Peace. He can bring peace to us individually. He can bring peace to communities that are divided. Ultimately, he will bring peace to the whole world. He is Christ the Lord. And so the vision that we have in Revelation, that final vision is the final chapter who's actually just the beginning. There, in chapter 21 and 22, we hear again of Jerusalem, but it's a very different type of Jerusalem. It's a metaphor, it's a picture of God's people. All those who have heard the message, heed to it, and have learned to follow, to follow Jesus. That's described as the Lamb here. So the Christian hope is not going to heaven when we die. That stage could say one. The real final Christian hope is when heaven and earth are fully reunited and human, and human experience and human life is completely transformed, healed and enhanced. And so we have here, as we hear, Eden restored. But it's not going back to what was. What we go back to is enhanced and transformed 
This week, uh, on morning prayer on Zoom, we had this famous passage of Isaiah 55 that speaks of this enhancement and transformation when it says, you will go out in joy and be led forth in peace and the mountain and the hills will burst into song before you. The whole of creation will be freed and the trees of the field will clap their hands. No more thistles, but giant sequoias. That's a kind of a liberal translation of the message, but I think it makes a sense. No more thistles, but giant sequoias. No more thorn bushes, but stately pines. This will be for the Lord's renown, for everla- an everlasting sign, and that will endure forever. And so what does John see? Here we have a few of the picture. The first is this river, a river of water of life, as clear as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb. The idea of water is well known in the Gospel of John because that's a living reality that should already be expressed in every believer. Flows of living water that is expressed through us, through the Holy Spirit, through God's life. But here we have even more. It comes from not just God, but the Lamb. Christ is at the heart of it. It flows from his throne, the throne of God and of the Lamb. Rather than locating Christian hope in the promise of restored city or a temple, he sees it in a gathering of all the believers who have that living water springing out of them because of God and what Jesus had done for them. So we have this first picture of river of waters of life. We have then a second picture of um, John placing that river with the tree of life and crops of monthly fruit. Again, taking us back to uh, the Garden of Eden with the tree of life. But here there is a healing for nations. It's not just two people. There is a gathering of nations. And it's about healing and not curse. Our story, human story, started with a curse through the disobedient. The human story will finish with blessing and healing. And third, there will be no more light and the Lord God will give them light. And we see, if we see um, night as the idea of darkness, maybe evil, that means there will be no more evil. In that new creation, it will be freed, freed from the power of sin, freed from the power of death, freed from all the evils that we still experience today. There will be nothing which might prompt God's people to rebel against him again. Fourth, um, Adam and Eve, had um, their evil was to seek divine knowledge, but in a wrong way. And that had um, as a consequence that they couldn't be in the presence of God. They were driven away from that place. That reality of separation which we all have experienced to some extent, being separated from God and how Jesus has bring us back. But there, they will see him face to face. They will see his face and his name will be on their foreheads. That's the coming back of that perfect, unashamed, with no guilt relationship with God. We will see God face to face and be unafraid. It will be like seeing the best friend that we have been trying to follow the best we can. They will see his face. And faith, they will reign forever and ever. And this is real life, life beyond time. And I like the description of C.S. Lewis in the the last battle in his uh, series, uh, Chronicle of Narnia. He says this, all their lives and all our lives in this world and all their adventures, all our adventures, I hope your life is still an adventure. It should be an adventure. There will be challenges, but it should be. Oh, but all that had only be the cover and the title page. Now at last, they were beginning chapter one of the great story, which no one on earth 
has read, which goes on forever and ever, and in which every chapter is better than the one before. Now when that sinks, how is it that we don't want to share that with our friends? How is it that we still struggle, and I struggle? We need to fill our mind with that reality of heaven, so that out of that and out of love, we will want to share that good news. Finally, John says, those words are trustworthy and true. The Christian hope that we share is not pie in the sky. It is trustworthy and true. And not only this, but it says Jesus is coming. And he's coming soon. And that's because the writer in Revelation is a pastor. And he wants to motivate his people, his reader, and he wants to motivate us to be ready. Or a better maybe translation is to ready ourselves every day. To have those disciplines, those realities in our lives where every day we meet with God, we start with God, we think about God, and we learn to listen to him and to heed to him. So to conclude, if we look around the truth, and you only need to um, start your TV set, the truth is that there is no universal worship and obedience to God. We're not there yet. But he has revealed his plan through Jesus Christ. And we have been the one who responded, responded to that call and are, like the disciples, are called to go and to make disciples, to tell what God has done in our lives and what God wants to do in their lives. But what is sure is that God's kingdom has started through Jesus Christ, has grown with part of God's kingdom and will one day be fully realized. What Jesus has started will be fulfilled. So the question to me and to you today, as we remember the reality of a world that's still broken with its conflicts and wars, will we as his followers continue to live our lives in accordance with the nature and the purpose of his kingdom, a kingdom that is surely coming? I know that you want, and as we do, Maybe the best to finish this uh, message is to say the grace. And for those who know, let's say it together as a way to wish us the best in our lives, the best journey in our lives. So let's say together for those who know. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen. Jesus said, surely I am coming soon. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. I've got some news for you. Um, some of you will remember Jeanette Ball and Malcolm. Jeanette has fought her last battle and is now part of that story. Um, the funeral will be later this, this uh, week. And if you want to know more, uh, contact uh, Marion Gentili or myself for that. And now I'm going to ask Janet Tall to uh, lead our prayers. Let us pray. Lord, on this Remembrance Sunday, we remember those who have given their lives or their freedom for others. Those who have died in wars throughout your world. For soldiers who died in battle or later of their wounds. And for the countless civilians caught up in conflicts. We especially remember those who died in the two world wars, members of our family or people from our town 
including the people named on our own war memorial, who were linked to this parish and who gave their lives during those conflicts. Lord of hope, we pray for peace. Lord, for the people of Ukraine, the 24th of February 2022 will be remembered as a day when their futures changed forever. We pray for the ongoing situation in the country and ask for wisdom for the leaders of the nations giving aid to Ukraine. Be with those in charge in Ukraine as they make critical decisions. And we pray for your peace and comfort for all who have lost loved ones, as well as their homes and their way of life, including the Ukrainian refugees that have found temporary sanctuary in Somerset. Lord of hope, we pray for peace. Lord, for the people of Gaza and Israel, the 7th of October 2023, will long hold painful significance. We pray for the devastated families of whatever nationality and creed, whose lives and security have been shattered during that conflict in recent weeks. Lord, our news is saturated with images that are hardly bearable to watch, and peace feels a distant hope at the moment. But still, we pray that there may, might be a resolution in this troubled part of the world, which so many hold as a holy land. Lord of hope, we pray for peace. And Lord, be very close to the people suffering from the effects of war and unrest in other parts of the world, which may not be in our news bulletins daily. Those people will also have dates etched in their memories relating to their own difficult times. The date when their village in Yemen ran out of food. When the family in Sudan realised that their only hope was to travel to a refugee camp in neighbouring Chad. Or the date that the daughters in Afghanistan gave up hope of an education. Help us to renew our fight against injustice, prejudice, greed and oppression, which is at the root of so much of the conflict in today's society. We give thanks for the many people involved in helping in those countries, including the aid agencies and those campaigning for peaceful solutions. Lord of hope, we pray for peace. And we pray for all those who help in a more local way to ensure that we work together for our communities, including those involved in social work, the Beeson, Street Pastors, Open Door and the Food Bank. We remember those who face difficulties in their lives through illness, the loss of a loved one, issues in families or stresses in their place of work. We think of those known to us, including the family of Jeanette Bowell. And Lord, we also remember the hope that you bring. We thank you that you have made promises that we can have confidence in. You said, peace I leave with you, my peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. Let us hold on to these words as we go forward into the coming week. Lord of hope, we pray for peace. And now let us say the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. 
for the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Lord of the Church, may hope fill our hearts. Let us pray and work together to build a world of peace and justice for all. Amen. Good. So the idea with notices is that you have a carousel before the service and, and after. So this is very short. Just to remind, um, if you're fairly new to the church, you haven't uh, have been through a welcoming lunch, uh, it will take place next uh, Sunday. So if your name is not on the list and you would love to have a free lunch and to hear a little bit more about the life of the church, uh, come after the service, see me or anyone who has a badge that says a welcomer and then we'll put your name on uh, the list for next week. And we're going to sing our closing hymn, Praise to the Lord. strength of the Lord, to love and serve him. And may the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen. Amen. Please remember there's prayer ministry available and there's also tea and coffee. Do stay and talk. There's going to be a video playing, but it's a background. There's no need to sit and watch it if you it's more important to talk to people.
failing to scribe your heart on history's page.